Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm McKenna from Murder by the Book in Houston, and I think you guys are in for a treat today. I'm already um, laughing at our, our pre-event conversation, and I can't wait to sit back and listen to these two authors talk. Um, of course, we're going to be here with Carol, Ka Carol Johnstone and Sarah Penborough this afternoon to celebrate the release of Mirrorland by Carol Johnstone. There's the get the, the lighting correct. Um, as always, if you have questions, you're, if you're watching on YouTube, you can put those in the live chat, or if you're on Facebook, you can put them in the comments. And um, I will be monitoring those for the second half of the conversation. We'll, we'll try to get to them in a little bit. Um, also, I'm going to drop a link in the comments shortly with more information on um, both Mirrorland as well as uh, Sarah's books. Um, if you're interested in ordering, that information and the order link are right there. So um, that's that. I will also say tonight, uh, we have a busy event schedule this week. I think we had nine authors or something. So tonight we'll be back with Mary Kay Andrews and Karen Slaughter. Um, John, our event coordinator, is going to be doing that event um, with them. But we have another five authors for the rest of the week and May really packs a punch with some pretty cool virtual events. So make sure to check out murderbooks.com for the full event schedule and, um, you know, click our likes and all those things so you get notifications when we have um, events happening. Okay, so let's get to the reason we're here. Carol Johnstone, hi, how are you? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, read your bio, get you introduced, and then we'll bring on Sarah. Carol Johnstone's award-winning short fiction has appeared in annual best of anthologies in the US and the UK. She lives in Argyll and Butte, Scotland with her husband, Mirror Land, as I said, I will hold it up again. Congrats on the new debut <laughs> novel. I can't wait to hear all about it. Um, of course, let's see. And here is Sarah, hi. Hi. Sarah Penborough is the number one Sunday Times and New York Times bestselling author of the psychological thriller Behind Her Eyes and more than 20 other novels and novellas, including The Death House and a young adult thriller, 13 Minutes. She's also written for the BBC and her latest book, I believe, if I'm getting this right, is Dead to Her. Um, so I am going <laughs> to I'm going to get myself a cup of tea and I'm going to sit back here and listen <laughs> and um, enjoy this conversation. I will be back on in a little bit. Just call me on when you're ready for questions. Have fun. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now we could talk about her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, before we talk, it's lovely to see you, by the way, in all this yes. pandemic from the opposite yeah, end of the country. Um, before we start talking about the book, I wanted to ask how it feels and I can pretty much guess the answer, to have like your debut novel, which has got so much praise and it's had such a big campaign. And how does it feel to have it coming out in the middle of a pandemic when everyone's <laughs> locked in at home and you can't be doing this in the actual bookstores? How yeah. do you feel? It's really strange. Um, I sold it way back at the beginning of 2019, such a long time ago. And obviously back then there was, you know, nobody had any idea this would happen. And even, you know, all the way through the kind of lead up, there was nothing. And then I remember last, was it March, the first lockdown, when it really started yeah, kind of... My birthday, up. yeah. Oh, was it? Oh. <laughs> Happy birthday. And it was, yeah, I, I remember thinking, oh, this is awful. I felt really bad for everybody who had books out in 2020, but I remember, and this is this is so selfish, but I remember thinking, ah, but I'll be okay. Because by the spring, you know, 2021, <laughs> there's no way this is still going to be going on. I'll be absolutely fine. And and then obviously Christmas happened, and then the second lockdown happened at the end of December. And I remember thinking, yeah, but it might still be okay, might still be okay. It was pushed, the book, because it was supposed to come out at the very beginning of April originally um and then obviously they pushed it to when the bookshops in in england and wales were reopening but yeah it, it was a lot different to how i'd always imagined it was going to be yeah i, I was like oh i mean it's such a big thing i mean i know it's not you we're going to talk about your past career in a bit but i know it wasn't your first sort of story but it's the big it was like my behind her eyes it's your big moment yeah and you you know you kind of want to 
go places and have people raise a glass and and be yeah. bitter behind your back. I was, I was kind of completely obsessed with having. I really, I don't know why this is the thing for me. This is the big thing for me. Is I was obsessed with the idea of having my book on a poster in the tube. Oh yeah, like, I have no idea. That's the one thing that I was just like, oh, I everybody wanted. wants that thing. That's the thing. <laughs> you know, you just want it, even if you don't see it. You want your friends yeah. to take pictures of it and send it to you. I was saying, oh. I avoid the chip like the plague, you know, but I, I just wanted it to be there. So, I mean, there's lots of things, yeah, that, that haven't happened that I've wanted to happen or, or, or not necessarily wanted, but just assumed maybe but would happen. I think where you will, where it will change will be the paperback, you know, because obviously the paperback is the big thing. So you'll get all of that then and we will meet in London and we will yeah. um, oh. do that. two bits <laughs> later and see it. I'm well, like, people who um might not know about the book and this is a question i particularly loathe when given to myself so i apologize in advance can you give us just a brief summary of what the story just a brief sort of teaser of the story yes i have um i can't take credit for this at all but i always put this at the beginning because it's better than my summary um the uh my then editor at Scribner came up with this amazing you know how they always go on about elevator pitches you yeah, know can you describe yeah. your novel in a sentence so she came up with this and I use this all the time because I think it's fab but it was um Mirrorland is a, a gothic suspense about um identical estranged twin sisters the man they both love the house that has always haunted them and the dark and wonderful childhood that they can't leave behind. <laughs> and I think that's great. I'm going to send honestly. her my next book. Yes. <laughs> Who it's a long sentence, but it's still a sentence. It's quite a complex book. It's not an easy one to summarise because there is a lot no. happening in it. No. But for the, just to go to basics, because I had to actually look this up when I was reading your proof ages ago. Can you just explain what the difference is with mirror twins compared to normal identical twins? Yeah, so so mirror twins, they're one of these things that there is nothing definitive known about them. A lot of it's just kind of speculation, but they're cons they're identical twins, um, but they're not like normal identical twins in that they're exact mirror reflections of each other. So in a okay. sense, they're non-identical. It's the person that you see in the mirror is would be there. there so it literally is a mirror a reflection exactly yeah so so one might be left-handed one might be right-handed one might have a mole here the other one have a mole here yeah but the 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 sort of the, the the theory is that the they are created when the egg splits a lot later in the fertilization process so i think okay. it's I might be wrong, but I think it's about 10 days after conception, which is really late. And I think if it's any later than that, they would become conjoined twins. So it's kind of like that very last bit. Oh, it's so quite almost a natural feel to it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. They, they, they're supposed to be more like conjoined twins than identical twins. So they have a lot of experiences of ESP, you know, feeling each other's pain. And that's, that's documented a lot more than it is for which you do yeah. use at the start of the book because when Kat is coming back from LA she just won't accept that maybe Elle is is dead dead you know, no, no I'm not giving anything away am I Elle no. goes missing in a boat presumably. yeah so shall, shall I do my my spoiler free summary that's not, yeah, not as good as that one. To, to, to get people a flavor of that starting just the starting point in case you spoil yeah. questions Carol because I've got <laughs> I'm sorry I'll try my best <laughs> So, so yeah, it's a it's a, a gothic suspense. It's set in Edinburgh in Scotland, and it's about estranged identical twin sisters, Cat and Elle. Um, Cat lives in LA, and Elle lives in Edinburgh with her husband Ross in the very kind of creepy old house that that she and um, Cat grew up in. And at the beginning of the novel, um, Cat um, has to come back from, from America uh, because Elle has gone missing in her sailing boat. And she discovers that someone, she thinks Elle has, has left her a uh, treasure hunt. Um, there are clues that have been left all over the house uh, for, for Kat to find. And Elle used to do that when they were children. We're gonna stop there because I okay. think that gives us a nice setup, doesn't it? And <laughs> Elle is married to their childhood friend who was very much right. involved. In, and what I mean, what I loved about it 
I mean, I've got loads of things to talk about that I loved about it. And I'm going to jump around a bit because that's how my brain works. But <laughs> I love the idea of um, unreliable memory. Because when I read this, I rem I remember having this if, up to about three years ago, four years ago. If anyone had asked me what my first car was, and given I didn't pass my driving test until I was 25, so it's not yeah. 17, yeah. I would have gone blind I had a golf. In my head, I had a golf. And then I was in Spain visiting some friends that I knew when I had that my first car, and they said, you had a Tigra. And it all slotted back. I was like, oh, my God. I yeah. almost had a golf. But I got a Tigra, but because I had just over the years, I would have put my house on it. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that we can't even trust our basic memories. And when I read mm -hmm. it in yours, I definitely got the sense. I've read lots of books where memory is a plot device. Mm -hmm. In yours, it is a plot device, but it also feels like, and I might be wrong, but it feels like something that you personally are quite fascinated by. Is that right? Yeah, I'm so fascinated by it. I mean, the 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 kind of the whole premise of it came from something that did happen to me that's very similar to what you were just saying something that I completely believed my whole life and then subsequently found wasn't wasn't true because the uh, this is a long story the <laughs> the um the house that the that is um in Maryland so 30, 36 West Street Road it's very much modelled on my grandparents' house. They had this. It's gone out the window there, Carol. That's okay. Well, I won't, I won't go any more in that direction. No, no, fine. Just, yeah. we'll just answer it now. Just go big. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I always, when I sort of sat down to think about writing, the, I had this sort of big idea. I wanted to write a really gothic psychological thriller. Um, I wanted to write about a creepy old house. Um, I wanted to write about a love triangle. And I wanted, you know, at, at the heart of it, there to be this big terrible huge secret that 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 nobody was really interested in in, in revealing or, or or looking at but I didn't have an actual kind of proper plot and um I always thought that I would set it in the middle of nowhere I wanted to set it in the I don't know the Scottish Highlands or something like that in this great big huge mansion like um uh, the haunting of Hill House you know this great big huge place and um Every time I sat down to do it, I just kept seeing my grandparents' house. And they, they died in the, gosh, it would be mid to late 90s. So it was really my memories of that house when, when my sister and I were growing up and we went there every summer. It was a crazy house. And it was in Leith in Edinburgh. So the kind of poor area of Edinburgh. So very much not the middle of nowhere. But, and it wasn't a particularly big house either, but it was old. I think it was Georgian. It was 200 odd years and old. It was probably quite a lot smaller. So it probably yeah. seemed quite a lot bigger. Exactly. And we, we, we lived in a, a, a little bungalow, a kind of 60s style bungalow. So this was the polar opposite of that. We loved it. There were all these places that we weren't allowed to go because it was falling to pieces. There were, there were kind of parts of the house that were dangerous to go into you know we weren't allowed to go into the cellar because it was this, it was it was it was leaking the roof was always leaking there was no central heating it was freezing cold house but we loved it because it was mad and it had rooms that didn't seem to serve any purpose at all you know the, the, the a lot of the the elements of 36 west street road it's definitely sounding quite similar same. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they, they, in fact, the floor plans the same. All the rooms existed in the exact sort of, mainly because then I didn't have to think about I'm it. I was going to say, it's like, that's a, that's a nice way to not have to actually make something yeah. up. You're spending <laughs> yeah. a lot of time making everything up. <laughs> exactly. Um, there was a servant bell pool system. Um, I think in, in Mirrorland, I used the kind of, the, the sort of ones they had in Downton Abbey, you know, yeah, with the bells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in my grandparents' house, it was Victorian. And in, in Victorian times, they were electronic. So you had like a button in all the rooms on the wall and you press this button. And then in the kitchen, there was a big board on the wall that had these little stars. And every time you pressed a button, the star of each room would swing. Oh and then there'd be this little noise. So when you're kids, stuff like that is great, you know. My had... family in a little flat on Prestonfield Estate in Edinburgh. <laughs> we didn't have that. <laughs> I mean, such it was such a cool house, but they never had any money to fix it. I was going to say, it was all <laughs> like that, but lovely. <laughs> and I mean, even the, the the sort of parts of Mirrorland, so the, the stonewash house, 
and the alleyway alongside the house mm -hmm. where the sisters create this kind of weird and wonderful childhood magical world Th they existed as well my sister and I used to play not not to, they didn't look like how they look in Maryland I kind yeah. of embellished quite a bit but but those places existed um oh and as well there was a an art deco bar in the kind of living room they called it the drawing room and um and that became the Poirot in Mirrorland. Yeah, I've got a really yeah, funny yeah. story about the Poirot that I always keep forgetting to tell. So I'll, I'll remind we'll me to we'll tell you. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so to get back to the question you were actually asking me, there was a room at the back of the house. Um, and in Mirrorland, in the book, it's the pantry. And that's how the girls get down into Mirrorland at night. Mm -hmm. um, in my grandparents' house, it was called the sewing room. And um, <laughs> the sewing room. And all that was in it, it was this horrible kind of forgotten about room at the back of the house. Um, it was almost under the stairs. And it was where my grand did all her mending. There was like a singer sewing machine in it. And that was it. And then at the very end of the room, there was this humongous cupboard and you could kind of climb up into it and um, it took up the entire wall. And we used to play a lot of games, hide and seek and sardines, things like that, because the house was so cold, you had to keep moving. <laughs> and, and, we, and that was where I hid almost all the time. That was my favorite hiding place, especially for sardines, because you know, you need a quite yeah, big yeah, yeah. And everyone kind of always forgot that that room existed. It was weird because it was such a non-room, you know, you just forgot it was there. So you could hide in there for a long time before anyone remembered. And I always remember that there was a door in the back wall of this wardrobe, inside the wardrobe. Um, and it was like a normal full-size door. I can see it if I if I shut my eyes, it was, it was white and it was it had four vertical panels um it had you know those ceramic door handles yeah, that yeah. it oh, had one of them yeah yeah and it was always locked i would try it was always locked and i never never wondered why it was there i knew that this was the outside um wall of the house i knew that it didn't go anywhere the back of the house was on much lower ground than the front it was kind of built on a hill yeah so i also yeah. knew that the door was sort of 10 feet above the ground you know it was no it, it couldn't you, you wouldn't be able to open it and go anywhere yeah. but of course yeah. I always thought this is like lying in the witch the wardrobe that's no, for sure that. one exactly and I thought that my entire life I just accepted that there was a door in the back of this wardrobe or cupboard for for no apparent reason and then years and years later I was talking to mum that was the house that she sort of grew up in and I was talking to her about maybe setting a story there. I have actually set quite a lot of short stories in that house as well. And she told me, I, I can't even remember why I mentioned it to her, but she kind of gave me this really weird look and said, there's not, there was never a door in the back of that cupboard, are you mad? <laughs> and as soon as she said it, I did think, yeah, that's a weird thing to believe. It's a weird thing to believe as a kid, but it's an even weirder thing just to think your entire life because I think about it quite a lot. Yeah. And so, and that's sort of exactly the same as you. That oh, really and I still, I still think there's an alternate reality for me who yeah. had a dip in golf because I still, in my heart of hearts, <laughs> it was a golf, even though I know it was a tigra. Like you're forever going to think there is a door. Yeah, I in can't that, actually it. see it. You know, if I think about it, I see it. It's there. It's you so know? fascinating. And memory is so unreliable. I mean, I read something once that is, you've probably read it researching this actually, that you only really remember your last memory of the memory. Yeah. So every time you remember it, you're photocopying it and it's coming out mm -hmm. slightly different than the time you remembered yeah. it before. And that's Which so really weird, isn't it? Isn't you, it? You always overwrite it. And yeah. if you're, you're thinking of something because you're sad or you're thinking of something because you're happy, you automatically transfer all that onto your memory and then yeah. the next time you remember it, it's changed. And it's so like the really big memories, the really important ones, they're the ones that are the least true. You know, I, th I think it's so interesting, especially childhood memories. I mean, they've totally different. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I pick up, and I, I love it in storytelling and in my, in my life, I love this idea of who, what happens to us as children and how it feeds into us as adults. And it's very much a core premise with all of them, with Ross and Kat and Elle. They're tied mm. together in this 
scenario, aren't they? I mean, it's yeah. the strangest, without ruining anything, it was a really interesting take on a love triangle because it is a stereotypical, in some ways, from the out, outlook looking in, a very stereotypical psychological thriller love triangle. And was there ever a point in the planning when you considered not making it a love triangle or was it always going to be that way? I think it was always going to be that way because I love love triangles. Yeah, I do. love them. I, I, I've always loved, I love love triangles and I love revenge plots. Those are yeah. my two favorite things. Yeah. And I thought well, I have to, you know, have at least one, if not both. I think that they're really cool because they're, they're, a way of introducing conflict even before you introduce other conflict and mistrust you know? as well isn't it there's a real yeah, exactly. and betrayal especially mm -hmm. if you're talking about twin sisters or you know people that are very very close already because especially with with mirror twins you know the bond between them is so yeah. strong you have to wonder what it would take to to kind of break that bond and obviously that's and for the man as well, like you've got yeah. this, one's gone missing and then you've got this other woman who looks so much like your wife or, you know, whichever way round it works. You're kind of, you know, you can see that it's a it's a mess. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, I think I think twins, just from my personal viewpoint and obviously is from all the critics, etc. Twins can are very easy to get wrong. Yeah. You know, and you got them really right. It wasn't about them being twins, really. You know, I mean, no. it, it wasn't about the twinness of them. It was no. that kind of in there and that all that rivalry between sisters, et cetera, is much more. I mean, and what's interesting about Elle, I think, like on her journey looking for her, Kat's really looking for herself at the same time, mm. isn't she? And I, I really feel Elle's presence. Right? It's kind of like a ghost story. Yeah. Her, isn't it? And was that intentional to infuse it with the sense of, because you know, a ghost story is someone talking from the dead, isn't it? And now leaves these, there's these, this treasure hunt, mm. and it's an unreliable. Because it's not always a pleasant thing, is it? No, you know. No. Yeah, and I did, because I, I love gothic stories mm. anyway. But I didn't now want to write. Just, it. just a quick aside, just for. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not obviously trying to talk down to viewers, but I often ask, need questions answered when I'm watching something. So, how would you just on a quick? What makes it gothic? You know, how would you, what adds to the site? What is the gothic of the psychological thriller for anyone who's not really sure? Quite, we say gothic a lot, and it, you know, we do, we do, and it's really broad, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's, it can mean sort of different things to different people, I suppose. Mm. For me, gothic is a feeling or an atmosphere, it doesn't need to be like a creepy old house, it's or house or the light exactly. And the Although that's good, we like uh, that. Yeah, <laughs> it's more a kind of atmosphere that that's sort of beautiful and lovely and sexy, but also quite dark and dangerous and threatening, and you're never quite sure what. I think that gothic stories always, always, always have some sort of passion or, or like a love triangle involved mm. and betrayal and all the rest of it. But they also mainly have a mystery or a secret. I think that they're the most important things is, is that there's always something at the heart, like, for example, Jane Eyre, because yeah. that's not about ghosts, but it's about a secret. And you don't know what that secret is until you get to the end. I do feel sometimes with Gothic, it's the closest in, because it, it, I mean, it, it crosses the borders with the supernatural so much, doesn't yeah. it? Even if, you're writing a, even if you're writing a straight thriller in a Gothic tradition, exactly. there's always a feel of something slightly out of the corner of your eye. Yeah, there. definitely, definitely. Mm. And I mean, I think one of the most Gothic stories that I've ever read is um, Gillian Flynn's first novel, Sharp Objects. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's all gothic and again it's not because there's a big house it's I think gothic has a lot to do with an unreliable narrator and then everybody else around them also being quite unreliable everything's mm. a little bit off center not quite I right mean, there's no I'm one reliable in Mirrorland there's literally no no, no. and even even <clears> if they <throat> they think they're reliable they're not reliable you know that <laughs> nobody is reliable even the even yeah. the honest characters are not reliable in it which is I thought I really I love an unreliable narrator but and I like it when they're not arch unless they're supposed to be being arch and that none of yours yeah. are they're all very true yeah to themselves. And I, I thought as well oh sorry it was um 
Well, you're a novel, dead to her. I think mm -hmm. that's. I love Southern, Southern Gothic. Southern oh, it's so good. Yeah. And that's. I think you can channel Southern Gothic, even when you're not writing. When you're half <laughs> Milton Keynes, half yeah. half half Milton Keynes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's such because I mean it's the same thing, isn't it? It's a feeling. You mm. know, your book is full of that feeling. It's just. It's very and hard I, to explain. I do think that places has a sense of the Gothic as well. Like I think that yeah. has, and I, I mean, like I mean, I did read somewhere that you, because I was like, oh, she must have lived in Edinburgh all her life. Obviously, haven't. <laughs> um, but and again, you didn't live in Edinburgh while you were writing Maryland. You went off to mm -hmm. Cyprus, is that right? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. where you want to write Gothic fiction in some lovely <laughs> sunny Cyprus. I think it's too <laughs> I did. You wanted to get like concentrate on. Oh, I had this like terrible cliche dream, a bit like it the. Reminded me of Graham Joyce. <laughs> Graham Joyce did it, didn't he? His first novel. He went off to a Greek island. He did. Right. And I actually, I remember um, reading that that they <laughs> turned out and saying, "Yeah, that's what." That's what what I mean? I thought it was just kind of Joyce. <laughs> just... <laughs> I just really wanted to go, yeah, to a Greek village somewhere. Um, write my first novel. I, at that point, I had been working in the NHS for 20 years, my kind you of whole... Like, you needed the sunshine. <laughs> I did. And I was just fed up. I was burnt out. I was fed up. I, I, I kind of, I hit 40 and a lot of things changed in my life, not really for the better. Um, and it, you know, it, this is a horrible cliche, but I do think that most of us kind of go through life thinking, We've got all the time in the world to to do the things that we want to do. You know, I've written all my life for the the for sort of the last ten years before I wrote Mirrorland. I was I was writing short stories, but I was always kind of going, oh, you know, I'll write my novel when I've got time. You had a novel in a drawer somewhere, didn't you? I read. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've all got those ones that you just start and then you don't finish, or you finish it's you don't feel like it's good enough or whatever, and they just. Yeah. But there is a 40 thing, definitely. I mean, I'm coming up 50 next year and I'm really feeling that. Got to keep going, got to keep going, got to keep, yeah. you know? Absolutely. You think, oh, God, is it? Because, I mean, publishing is Is it going to happen for me is the big thing. Yes, yeah. definitely, definitely. And mm -hmm. and, and I, I just got fed up doing everything in my spare time. And, you know, the, the job, I liked my job, but it was hard work and it was it often Emotionally. quite depressing. Oh, very, yeah. very. I, mean, I worked in oncology and, yeah. you know, I, I saw a lot of, of, of kind of quite harrowing things, but they also made me think, right, now I have to do it now. You know, there's never going to be a good time to do it. So I convinced Ian to to quit his job as well. We both was we he both like, did. let's do it, baby. Let's go. Cyprus it was, day, it was a little bit of convincing. Yeah. But yeah, eventually. And we just we blew everything. We we spent all our savings. Um you're so we, lucky you have someone that would go along like I know. that. You know? I know. So, you're so because it's kind of thing as well. I, I think, I mean, you're probably braver than me. But I, I mean, when I read it, I was like, oh, my God, for my next book, I just want to pack a suitcase, take Ted and go. <laughs> it's quite on your own. It's quite a, a thing. I mean, yeah, I, I ended up sort of saying to him, I'm going to do it sort of with or without you oh I, mean, this, I just I don't know I felt this proper kind of I've got to do it I've got to do it and then as soon as I decided I just thought I've got to do it you know so it it, it was great at the time but we ran out of money in about six months <laughs> and then I realized oh god you know we'd sold our house and everything we we had no home no jobs I, I didn't even have an agent at that stage. You're like, someone buy this bloody yeah. <laughs> yeah. We came back to Scotland. We moved in with my father-in-law. And, um, yeah, that, that was a period of about six months after a great six months. Where I park and like, oh, my God. <laughs> Total panic. And we never a great story. It. I mean, like, what a great. I mean, like, it would have been a shit story if no one had bought the book and you were <laughs> living under a bridge in Edinburgh with your husband constantly saying, I told you we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah. but, so, how, so you come back and you've got this wonderful book. And what is the next stage? Did where, where did how did you get did you get an agent or did you sell the book first or did you sell the film rights first? Or how did that work for you? Because it's the tricky. You can have a great book and be really hard to get an agent and sell it and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was really hard actually. The hardest bit was getting an agent, mm. and um, I think that took 
about five months or something. I mean, initially I sent out about six. It was such a small number, and I was I was super confident this would be fine. Off off I sent to these. Why don't you just people. email people like me and say, "Can you do an introduction to your agent?" I don't know. I I don't know. <laughs> My friends with um, Nina Allen, and she was like, "Oh my God, why didn't you tell me?" I to do it? your hand off. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so so I did that, and then I initially got a a full manuscript request within a couple of days, and I think it was I think it was from Curtis Brown, or you know, it was somebody quite big, and I was like, "Oh, brilliant!" I emailed everybody else, you know, that I sent to, and then I got another kind of three or four I think and then I got really sort of cocky I was like oh this is it I'm <laughs> fine you know you're on right and, move looking at all the five yeah, yeah, exactly <laughs> and then oh my god it must have been about three months I heard nothing at all absolutely nothing and in fact it was longer than three months because I sent it out in the summer and it was the end of autumn and I was really depressed because Ian had got a job by then in Glasgow and I was just spending my day at my poor father-in-law's house, <laughs> getting more and more depressed, yeah. and thinking I'm going to have Finch to actually... Finch yeah. <laughs> It was awful. <laughs> it was really awful because I thought, oh, well, I, put, I have literally put all my eggs in one basket. I didn't <laughs> have you, you any other the plans. Eggs, you've eaten the cake. There's yeah. not a basket left. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up sending out to more agents. Um, I remember speaking to to Nina and, and saying, oh, I've sent six. And she was like, six? six. <laughs> Get them like, out. Get it out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and yeah, eventually Ian had enough of me and he took me away to um, the Outer Hebrides on holiday <laughs> just to get me to, to stop moaning. <laughs> and as soon as we pulled up, to the holiday cottage. I got an email from one of the first agents offering me representation. I don't know if you've ever been to the Hebrides, but there is no internet. No. I would like to go. Oh, but it's now so you've said there's lovely. no internet. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> well, where we were on the east coast is fine. We were on were the you west hanging coast. over a cliff with your phone. Trying to <laughs> Ian was driving me around and we're trying <laughs> to get the signal. I was like, <laughs> so annoyed but eventually um i think i got three offers in the end and and i went with with heli ogden from jan Ness. but i went down to london i met them all it was Very it was nice. great and then she was going to take Maryland to the london book fair mm. which i think was february 2019 mm. um and about i think it was about two or three weeks before then we got a preempt for the TV um, mm -hmm. rights, which I think is a bit kind of ass backwards. I don't. I think normally you would. It can work, go one or the other. I've sold TV rights before a book comes out. Oh and, really? And vice versa. Yeah, yeah. But it's. But I mean, it's good because obviously it puts you in a great position when you go. It to was market. good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I think that it's really soon after that it went to auction mm -hmm. in the UK, and then there was a simultaneous auction in the US. Nice feeling, isn't it? Oh, it was so good. But it's also really weird. I think we got down to the last, you know, the last round. You know, what it was like final to... bids. They do that final yeah. bid thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I went down to London and I went to all the, the publishers' offices and they were pitching to me, you know, and oh, it was I know. It's the so... most weirdest thing. I didn't even enjoy any of it. I just kind of sat there the whole time. <laughs> And then in the evenings in the hotel room, I was talking to um, American publishers and that, well, that one was going on. It was the most surreal kind of three days, I think, of my life. But the American one, when I did it with Behind Her Eyes, at first I was like, when my agent said, will you take some calls on Behind Her Eyes? I thought I was having to try and sell the book. And she was like, no, I'm trying to sell it to you. And then what I did, I don't know if you did the same, your book might have been further along in its edited process, but they'd all got first draft. So when I was saying, well, what would you change about the book? And so mm. they were giving me all their notes and I was jotting down all the really good yeah. ones so that I could put them in the notes draft. Yeah. Even if I, Cause I thought, well, I've got like 10 of the best editors in New York here. Yeah. I, I totally did that. As soon as I got off the phone to them, I was making notes. Yes, and then, yeah. you know, <laughs> and then you put it the your editor's like, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, it just came yeah. to me. Just yeah. came to me. <laughs> it doesn't feel, it's like, I don't know about you, but it, you have the, especially, 
I think we both have that 10 year overnight success thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, really overnight success. But um, you have this, I don't know if, I mean, we've kind of gone off the tangent of the book. I'll pull you back in a minute. But you get this kind <laughs> of vision of how it's going to be. And I always thought when I had that kind of book deal, I would immediately be really good at yoga and drink coffee yeah. from a coffee machine and just be perfectly toned and my life would be brilliant. And actually, I, yeah. I think I was doing all these, having all these auctions and sitting on my sofa in Ealing in my sweatpants and you know a cup of crappy tea and just thinking this yeah. Is <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah no it is because you you feel very not very equipped to deal with any of it I, I do you know what the, the thing that I there were two things that I found really weird and and, and neither of them were things that I, I was expecting the, the first thing was that I'm so used to having a paycheck at the end of every month knowing exactly how much money i mean i didn't get paid a lot but i knew how much yeah, like I had to last and where exactly. it was going yeah. yeah yeah and i also had a lot of savings <laughs> for most of my you life just in oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but like all of that's gone and i am not the kind of person who likes uncertainty i like to know what's happening yeah. happening next week next month next year so that has been hard to get my head around and the other thing this is so mundane the other thing that i have found really difficult is becoming self-employed oh see i have an accountant now which still kind of blows my mind a little bit and you know i've had to learn how to do vat returns oh i just give it all to him and he oh, does <laughs> i wished i'd done that because i was like 100, I pounds, do 100 pounds a time <laughs> take it do it <laughs> there you go yeah. but there's great. just all these things that you're not you not only are you not expecting you don't even realize they're going to happen and it's it's all brilliant because it's exactly what you've always wanted but i think that that people humans in general are quite bad at when they've got a dream and this has been my dream since mm. i was wee is you only you see it as all kind of flowers and oh it's going to be and you never realize that of course there's there's going to be all practicalities there's also going to be the fear that never goes oh, away. Fear never goes away and i think no. i do think there's a thing that uh, the irony is that to be successful you have to never be happy yes there's an element of never being happy about being successful you know yeah. because i could easily not work for like 10 years probably but that would not you know so i'm constantly scared of the failure which i think is what yeah. happens you just the failure gets a bigger drop as well like it's a bigger yeah. drop to come down <laughs> you know so you get this five minutes of god we're such miserable women I know. <laughs> let's just get drunk but um could you bring it back to books briefly because you know i think that's probably why we're here <laughs> but, um, and you can tell it's been locked down and we're like oh, oh my god I've <laughs> um it's kind of mirrorland is kind of i mean all of it is 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 reflections isn't it the whole of the book is about reflections but it's also kind of a story within a story yeah. and within that story is uh, lots of stories are referenced as clues Mm -hmm. And you know, so we've got uh, Taylor Two Cities, Alison. So they're they're very clue type yeah. books. But did you use books that you are passionate about, or did you use them because they they suited the clue purpose? And what are your books that you get? What were your books that you when you were young were your escapes? You know, were your through that door that doesn't exist moment. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a bit of both. A lot of the books that are um, in Mirrorland, yeah, are books that I loved growing mm. up. Some of them aren't, some of them are, like you said, used because they were specific <laughs> ref yeah, reference certain things, certain clues. But, but yeah, I think when I was growing up, the, the thing that I loved the most were, were adventure stories. I liked kind of boy style books. My favorite writer, then um, when I was growing up with Alexandra Dumas I absolutely I loved her books <laughs> well, I love the three musketeers although they kind of annoyed me a little bit but I loved um the kind of Monte Cristo it yeah. is one of my favorite stories it's just the best I don't like what happens to Mercedes in it that mm -hmm. bothers me the same way as I don't like what happens to Lord Rochester's first wife in Jane Eyre but I love the rest of it you yeah. know it's like it's so good. So I loved his stories. I loved Alice in Wonderland, Lord of the Rings, Chronicles of Narnia, a little bit, you know. So all those kind of stories I really loved. Peter Pan you, was like when I was six. Peter, Peter Pan, Pan was my yeah. first like, oh, there's another world. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that and almost that's what they almost all mm -hmm. have in common, apart from Alexander Damas, I suppose. 
is that they're all about different worlds and and that is so it's so compelling when you're a kid yeah um, and so I think that they're, they're the sort of main stories that I love I loved I've also really loved Agatha Christie uh, my whole life I remember in my grandparents house in the bedroom that my sister and I shared, they had this glass cabinet and it was just full of every single book, I think, that Agatha Christie had ever written. And they were so old, you know, those kind of yellow books. They were probably worth a fortune. I know, I know. <laughs> and they were all from the same publisher, I think, virtually. So they probably were all like first editions. Yeah. They were beautiful. Um, and my favourite story was And Then There Were None. Oh, I love it so much. I mean, the, the version my grandparents had was the, it was not the very bad, worst. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the original, original bad one. But yeah, no, I loved that story. And I think just because psychological thrillers really are just whodunits, that's what they are. Um, yeah. They're just kind of a bit more personal. And then there was none, is that kind of, um, and then there were none. It's a very that gothic kind of, feeling. That book yeah, is it is. Bad. And it's a lot more personal, you know, mm. because there's no Poirot, there's no Miss Marple, it's a standalone, <laughs> and it's a very, oh, yeah. hello, Ted. <laughs> walked by the house. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, yeah, it's very simple, but it's massively effective. It's such a, a, a sort of haunting. <laughs> Um, and she's story. had a real resurgence, I think. Mm. And even in in writing, like um, like Lucy Foley is very much an homage to that yeah. kind of Agatha Christie esque. Put these people in a situation. Ruth Weir, she does a Ruth lot. Of the same. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a real kind of is is like a breakaway strand of psychological thrillers, mm. very much kind of Agatha Christie esque sort of stuff. Yeah. And we can't not mention. Um, obviously, the king himself. Okay. Yeah. How was that feeling when you got that quote? That was really strange. Again, really strange, like almost unenjoyably strange because it was so strange. I, I loved Stephen King, um, gosh, from when I was about 14. I think that was when I first. Everyone of our generation him. did, I think. I think yeah. everyone, everyone who read, read Stephen King. That was it. Definitely. I think the first book I read was Misery. Um, and I remember, <laughs> I've told this story, but I remember that um, in high school, um, in second year, I think it's slightly different in Scotland, um, we had to do this thing where you had to write a literary critique of a book mm -hmm. and you got to pick the book. And um, and I picked Misery because I you know I had just read it and I was like oh this is amazing this is so good um, and you know the boys all the boys in the class are writing it about you know Dragonlance and Dungeons and Dragons and things like that so off they all went to the Scottish exam board and the only one that came back with a I don't think this book is appropriate was Misery was Misery and I was so angry I was so put out by this so enraged on Stephen King's behalf that they, they, not allowed this to happen. They, they made me do Lord of the Flies instead I remember which is essentially it's not the same story but there are an awful it's lot really of damaging as well you know it's not exactly without its damage is it so yeah I, I when Scrivener first said we're going to send proofs out to writers we'll send one to Stephen King just in case you know and I was like, yeah, yeah, that's fine, thinking nothing would ever come of it. And then I remember, it was quite a while later, I think, I got an email from Nan uh, Graham, who's the sort of head of Scribner, and she was like, Steve is reading it. Steve loves <laughs> it. He's currently Steve reading it. it. And then that's when I sort of went, oh, God, this is bad, yeah. you know, because yeah. I would actually have preferred him never to have read it at all than to read it and then just for there to be and nothing. And just silence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> doesn't like it, but isn't going to say anything. So yeah, it was. I it, I think he he did. He didn't take long to read it at all, but it felt mm. like years. And then um, my then editor Valerie um, of the Elevator Pitch phoned me up and said, and she oh, when it, she would only ever phone me from New York if it was really good news or really bad news. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. thought, oh no. What and um, and she she sort of put me out of misery pretty quick, and she said, "Oh oh, he really he really really loves it. Do you want me to read out the um, the blurb?" 
And I remember saying to Ian, all I want him to say is that he loves it. That's it. He doesn't need to say anything else. It's and that was kind of touch the first one. It's touchstone moments, isn't it? Like all the money and whatever is one thing, but it's those touchstone yeah. moments of like a childhood hero or, you know, like you're kind of like, oh my God, this is just like the best thing ever. Sort yeah. of feeling. It I really suppose we should. We are now quarter two. We could have done that. I've got, we've oh. only done like three of my questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we can do this another time. Maybe that will yeah. be um, But we probably should uh, check on McKenna and see whether she wants to corral us. A little yeah, bit. I am. I am here, but I uh, my worries were unfounded that you would run out of things to talk about. And we have a quite like we have people who've commented so much about loving the books, but we don't have many questions. We have one question that I was already going to ask. So we're I'm going to pop that up on the screen here. Is Carol already working on her next book? Any ideas yet? Erica, well done. Actually on my list. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, one done. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've actually written the second book. I got a, I signed a two book deal in the UK. Um, so I finished the first draft. Oh gosh, I think um, around about spring, early spring. Um, so I'm doing the edits for that now. Um, it should be out, I think, in spring 2022, thereabouts. That's but, the same um, we might be, we might yeah, be in March. March. How are you? I mean, think they said April. Wow. So it's, <laughs> we be so we could... yeah. <laughs> but it's um, I'm sort of sworn to secrecy on some things, but it's it's a a very um unusual murder mystery set in the outer herbides and the unusual bits the bit i'm not allowed to talk about but yeah it's set in the outer herbides because it's one of my favorite places uh what do you think you'll set in scotland is that going to be your 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 place to set things or do you think you'll move them around i don't know i've kind of got a sort of idea for a third i like to have about maybe three or four ideas in the go otherwise i get panicky and um the next one i sort of thought i might do is set in essex nice mainly nice. because i sort of lived there for 20 years so it's probably the place i know the best and <laughs> probably more than scotland yeah what that about you because you? you just presume i think where did you set i read um what was the giving up smoking uh cold turkey Oh, that was set in Scotland as well. Yeah, <laughs> so, and that's what it threw me because I read that years ago. It was a great novella that Carol wrote about um, this, this very strange things happen to this man. And it's uh, you were clear. <laughs> were you giving up smoking at the time? Or I was. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that or I remember reading that and thinking, oh, she's going to have a great career if she can oh, ever sell her house, please. move to Cyprus and write a book. <laughs> yeah, they're the only thing she needs to do. I think you gave me a really good blurb for that one as well. Did, yeah. Yeah, I really it enjoyed it. It was really good fun. It was really good fun. <laughs> do you miss writing short stories? Yes, I do. I do. Do you? I, I really do. No? <laughs> I don't write them if I can possibly help it. Really? I think I've written about 10 in my entire career. <laughs> and they're never that short people say can we have no. 5,000 words and I go yes there's 15,000 words do what you will with it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no I would agree I think that that, that, that that now I would struggle I used to write short stories 10 years ago that were 2,000 words or something I think how did on earth would you do that so yeah I think now probably um, my short stories are more like novelettes or mm. novellas so yeah, yeah, I probably wouldn't be able to do a short, short story. Novellas are lovely length, though, isn't it? They I do are. Like novella length. It's a really mm. nice length. Sorry, McKenna, but did you have? I was. I took over your questioning there. That's fine. That's fine. I know you have more. Um, so <laughs> I would like to know what um, your next book is about, Sarah. And then we also um, have a question specifically for you. Um, thoroughly enjoyed behind her eyes as well as the Netflix miniseries is 13 minutes also going to be a miniseries 13 minutes is going to be a film so I am it was with Netflix it's no longer with Netflix I am I'm writing a film version of a book I wrote called The Death House for the Bohemian Rhapsody producers um, and they now want me to write 13 minutes as a film as well so I'm going to do that as a movie my next book is uh 
it's going to be out next March in the UK. I'm not sure when it's going to be out in America. Um, and it's called Insomnia. And it's another weird, twisty, sleep-related <laughs> story. But, um, yeah, so it's another sort of psychological thriller with some added weird in it. Yeah. They're the best ones. Can't wait. Um, for you, Carol, is Mirrorland going to be a movie or show? It's going to be a TV series. Well, hopefully. Um, I'm trying not to say that because I would say, oh, it's going to be a TV series. And I know that a lot of the time these things What don't, stage don't is it at? Are they got, who have they got adapting it? If they're only I'm the not audience? sure. I think they, that that's what they're they're in the process of doing at the moment, just mm -hmm. finding um, a writer. It's a tricky one, isn't it? It's a tricky one to do. It's quite... It is, I think so. And like it's, it's, rise, it's got a lot of kind of stuff that is hard to things. Mm. Yeah. I mean it's it's a joint venture, so it's it's um it's Heyday TV in the UK who who well Heyday Films did the yeah, Harry Potter movie that, stuff. Yeah. So that's kind of like fantasy. They do a lot they do a lot of T V stuff. They do they're good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and it's like a joint venture with NBC Universal in the US. Yeah. I think they've done like a few things they're, already. They're the so. same company, I think. Have they not got a link? I had a meeting with I, both of them about something. There's definitely some yeah, dynamic. They're, they're, I think you're kind of making a lot of things as a joint sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. A joint sort of process. That'd so be good. good. That'd be nice. So, yeah. I think um, it would be, um, I, I think a lot of the time when I'm writing, I kind of write as if, I can, I see I'm very visual, visual. So I can see that, yeah and I think a lot of the time I sort of think oh this would look really good on screen mm -hmm. and, and if I get stuck if I if I get really kind of stuck at a particular point I try to imagine what it would look like if I was watching it as a tv program or a film and that kind of gets me over the hump so I would love to I mean I can't imagine what what it was I know you have a lot of other things option but what was it like to actually see Something you'd written on the TV. Yeah, I can't I, I imagine. Saw that. It. I saw it last year because it was supposed to be on last summer and then they moved it to February because lots of things got shuffled, which mm. I'm really glad about. But when they sent me the link, I remember thinking, it's 2020. The world has gone to shit. <laughs> I watch this and it's bad. That's just finishing my <gasps> year off, which I know is shallow. Yeah. Everything that was going on in the world. But um, yeah, that was because I'm not a great person at. Um, taking a moment to celebrate things you know no. like something happens and I'm like okay next okay next yeah so when it came on the tv being the pandemic I was allowed to go to my mum's house because she's my bubble so we got a KFC <laughs> <laughs> I made her watch the whole thing um, and she did fall asleep towards the end which made for some very very entertaining <laughs> observations about the show um but I kind of thought okay that's it but it's not with tv because like with Netflix as well and it was such everyone was watching it Mm. And the Twitter was exploding and it was like number one here for like four weeks. We were number one in 72 countries. So it was mm. quite with a book. You have that delay. You write the book, it gets published. Who I don't write Amazon reviews. So you, you see a very limited mm. view of who's reading your book. Whereas with, with TV, it's like, I mean, that hashtag was, it was making me laugh every day. <laughs> like, so it was really surreal. And I can't now imagine those characters without it being... Oh. that and I'm actually working on the adaptation with the same people of my next book so oh. I'm currently writing episode one mm. so they've become those actors they've become those people yeah in my head they've become those people wow. and I just had to, I was very lucky I had a great experience with the production company and you know like and Netflix it, I was it was a really smooth ride you know it was literally from publication to the th show coming out was four years I think three years wow 2017, 2021, yeah, four years. So it was, as TV goes, pretty good. <laughs> That's quick. Yeah, it really is. You know, it is. <laughs> Bonus for you actually liking the product too. <laughs> oh, that was the best bit. I thought as long as I like it. Yeah. It must have been so nerve wracking the first time you watched it though. Well, a little bit, but then I remembered that I had taken the stonkingly huge paycheck. So, <laughs> you know, That's true. ultimately, if it was rubbish, it's, it wasn't uh, the book. It wasn't slagging the book off, and if it was good, people would go. I got the I got the credit because they stuck so closely to the book, even though it was such a tricky job to write it for mm. TV and direct it and 
I still, everyone was like, oh my God, Sarah, that was amazing. I was like, I know, I worked so hard on that show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, we do have another question and uh, it's from Kristen and I, she may need to clarify this. I'm not exactly sure. So who were your favorite characters in the books, both authors? So I'm gonna assume, let's start with Carol. I'm assuming she's talking about your favorite characters in Mirrorland because that's the book. Mm -hmm. um, but Kristen, maybe uh, pop a comment in here about which book for Sarah. I imagine behind her eyes. Probably, <laughs> yeah. probably. But let's start with you, Carol. And um Oh gosh, um, I think probably, obviously, Kat, I think, because I almost always write in first person. Um, it's not something that I deliberately do. I don't think it's just where I'm naturally most at home. Um, I have written in the third person. I've never written the second person. The second person terrifies me, but I have written in the third person a few times. But the yeah, the, I think Kat, probably, because she's the character that I know the most, um, she's the character that that I've had to kind of think about her motivations all the way through. So when she was a child um, and then also when she was an adult, why she makes the decisions that she makes. So I think that you automatically um, become more empathetic towards a character that you really have had to dissect all the way through. She always has to make decisions that reflect the kind of decisions that a person like her would make. So I think you have to know your that character inside out, especially if it's in first person, you're thinking a lot about the internal di the sort of dialogue that they will have with themselves or their thoughts and their feelings, how they change throughout the book. So I think just on that basis alone, I don't necessarily think that I liked her the most, but I think she's probably the, the character that I am most close to. Fair. And yes, we do have clarification that it is behind her eyes. I would say my <laughs> favourite. I've forgotten how much I liked them all, actually, till I was watching the show. Um, but Rob and Adele, every step of the way, I love that, mm -hmm. that too. Yeah, yeah, definitely my favourite. All right. We don't have any more questions, and it's about that time. I That's wish fair. that we could do your other 15 questions. <laughs> <laughs> Because there I was, was there was also my bonus <laughs> round, which is what would be your favorite superpower? Oh no, we're doing that. You oh. go. Oh, we're doing it. Go okay. ahead. We no, have my favorite super. When I was young, I used to think it would be being invisible, which I think is terrible because terrible I used idea. To, you could feel yes. what people were saying about you, which is awful. It would be to be able to fly. Yeah, that's Absolutely. the only superpower. The only superpower worth having. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if I'm on a plane, I try and imagine I'm Listen, It's all a quick it. fly around, Carol. It's not quite. <laughs> uh, Glasgow or Edinburgh? Glasgow. Oh, ketchup or brown sauce? Ketchup. McDonald's or Burger King? <laughs> Burger King. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Yeah, oh, it's all the wrong answer. Someone yeah. cancel that woman's book contract. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. or crisps? Oh, crisps. Early bird or night owl? <laughs> night owl. I'm yeah. up at five in the morning. I know you are. I see. Yeah. I see when you put posts. We're like that time. film, that old film with Michelle Pfeiffer and um. What was it called? Where she becomes a she becomes a bird and he becomes something else, and they only can meet. <laughs> like <laughs> that's, like that's like us. Okay, um, heels or flats? Oh well, I'd like to see heels, but flats always flats. I don't believe a woman who says they prefer heels to flats. Mm -hmm. McKenna, heels or flats? Oh, flats. I'm six <laughs> feet tall. It's gonna be flats all oh, day, every day. Yeah. Okay, comedy or weepies? Oh, weepies. <laughs> I'm counting our next event. This is such a poker, such a poker face from Sarah with these responses. <laughs> and then the last one, horror or sci-fi? Oh, that's hard. By my know, favorite, my one. favorite thing is horror sci-fi. Okay, you can You're pass right. that one because that's a good like alien. Yeah, we need to chat about. We need to chat about the McDonald's answer for a start. <laughs> I hate McDonald's. I love Burger King. Do you know, the I one love, thing I, I have craved, I have craved in lockdown. I don't have a car. 
We don't have a McDonald's in my high street. I literally, like, I have my neighbour. She's like, we're going to McDonald's. It's always when I'm in a meeting. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, KFC started to deliver. But I'm still oh, waiting for a Big Mac. Not McDonald's. Not drive that I can just, And then <laughs> the cheeseburger side order. <laughs> Oh, well, oh, I know yeah. I know when you have your next series premiere, what you're going to eat. KFC, oh, yeah. not this time. <laughs> I'm going to invite that Carol Johnston. And it's <laughs> going to take place at 6 o'clock in the morning. And oh, all those things are in McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> in McDonald's and brown sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, we have had we have had two people ask. We'll close on a on a reading question, although I would love to close on that uh, rapid fire. Um <laughs> we we have two people ask, what are the fav your favorite books that you've recently read? And this can also be a quick-ish answer. Um let's start with you, Carol. Oh, um, well, one that I've just read, which is very not like what I would normally read, is and I always get the title of this wrong, I think it's called Black Leopard Red Wolf by yes, Marlon no, right. Reigns. Yeah, mm -hmm. is that the right way, Ryan? It's mm -hmm. so good. Um, I, I really like his writing, but it's great. I think it's billed as a sort of African Game of Thrones, and it is like that. It's very brutal, but it's it's such a good book. It's it's a hard read, but it's such a good book. Did you say one or two? I didn't say. If you have a second oh. one, you can do it. <laughs> well, I, did, I just read a proof, which was really good, from Viper Books called... The Last Thing He Told Me by Laura Dave, which is a psychological thriller um, yes. that I just blurbed. And it's really, really good as well. Completely different from Black Leopard Red Wolf, but really, really good. Yeah. I think it's I, out this week or next in the, uh, yes, in the it's US. Like me. Yeah. 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 All right, Sarah, I you're up. I just read, um, it's not out yet. It's called The Beresford by uh, Will Carver, who writes the most bonkers crime novels and weird books. And he's just such an amazing writer. Um, but it's about, uh, the premise is great. It's about this block of flats. And like, it starts with this guy called Abe who's just murdered his neighbor. And he says he knows he's got 60 seconds to hide the body before the next tenant turns up because that's how it always oh. happens. So like when one person dies and that gets murdered in the block of flats within 60 seconds, another tenant arrives. So it's this weird <laughs> kind of Rosemary's Baby vibe to it. Um, but yeah, he's just such a brilliant writer um and what else i'm reading the sanatorium at the moment yeah you know which i've only just started so i can't pass comment <clears> on that <throat> but it seems to have done really well so i'm curious to yeah see. i think it's good it's um it's it's very similar to the last ruth Ware. i think it was poor timing it's both um alpine you know uh, yeah, yeah I think like close cast hotel yeah i think that's why when i got the proof i didn't read it as a proof because I got the two proofs at the same time. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is gonna be the yeah. same story. So I didn't read the Sanatorium, but now I'm curious. So, yeah. It's good, It's uh, it's got creepier vibes than the, the Ruth Ware. Um, but I think, anyway, I think it's good. But the same thing, like I had to have some space in reading them because it was like, oh, Swiss, Swiss. Yeah, and you, don't, <laughs> you don't want to judge one badly. Exactly. For another one, you kind of, you know, cause I don't buy it when people say, Oh, all these people have written the same book. You think, no, it's just unlucky. Sometimes you just get an mm -hmm. idea and it seems to be in the zeitgeist or there's something in the water. Mm -hmm. And so you can't judge, you know, judge them for being similar. So I'm curious yeah. to, to read. But my reading went completely off, off the wall with yeah. the pandemic. I did a lot of watching films. I didn't read a lot. So a lot of catching up to do. Yeah. Okay, well, we have done it, ladies. Thank you so yeah. much. This has been an absolute treat. Um, I know yeah. that people have really enjoyed the talk too. It's so it's so much fun when um, the two authors actually like get along, and we just feel like we're a fly on the wall. It's the best. So, um, <laughs> thank you. It's been a it's been really fun. I'm going to um, sign us off. Thank you for watching, and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.